We the North, we embrace our Northern identity, drawn to the national mythology of a Northern nation, a land of ice and snow. Joining us now for more on this Northern vision, in Iqaluit Nunavut via Skype, Alethea Arnachuk Baril, filmmaker and president of Unicot Studios, Inc. And in Vancouver, British Columbia via Skype, Cheryl Grace, a University Killam professor at the University of British Columbia. With us back here in studio, Ian Brown, host of Doc Studio at TVO, feature writer at the Globe and Mail, and Kevin McMahon, writer, creative director, and co-producer of that fantastic 10-part Polar Sea documentary series we've got running on TVO. Kevin, it's great to meet you. Ian, not that it's not great to meet you, but we've met before. We have. But Kevin, congratulations. It's a superb yeah, series, as you know. Terrific. Cheryl you. and Alethea, great to have you uh, on board as well from Points Beyond. Cheryl, I do want to start with you because the, the so-called ideas of North have long occupied Canada's national consciousness. And I wonder if you could just start by sort of setting the table for us. This ideas of the North, what does that refer to in your view? Well, in my view, uh, Steve, it, it refers to our history, our geography, and to the many, many, many works of art over years, decades, in fact, centuries, that have been created that try to imagine a North. And the, the catch in that is the majority of the imagining until mm, towards the end of the last century, the 20th century, was being done by people living in the south. So what they really knew about the high Arctic or even the far north was very limited. Some of them would travel there to get the experience and then try to come back and paint or write or compose music or, or film it. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a bit of a paradox really that it's uh, until fairly recently southern Canadians who have imagined this northern identity and been attracted by the north or repelled by the north, uh, both. And this has gone on, you know, through the 19th century, uh, the 20th century, and it's very much still with us now. We've had three prime ministers in my lifetime who have um, banked their political campaigns on a northern vision or some version thereof. Let me uh, pick up on that with Ian Brown because uh, it's true. Even those of us who live an hour from the American border, you know, during the Olympics, we are winter. And then, uh, you know, even the Raptors do the we the North thing. Uh, yeah. Where do you think the, uh, why do you think Canadians seem to apparently relish this northern geographic position that we're not really, all of us, entitled to? Not only relish it, I think we sentimentalize it a lot. And, and you know, we, we rely on it for some identity that maybe is not really ours to grasp as Southerners. Mm -hmm. But um, f from my uh, admittedly, you know, brief time up there, um, I think it has to do with humility. I, I, you know, there was a great tr uh, uh, Danish explorer named Knut Rasmussen. He was the first guy to go across the north. Uh, on a dog sled. He made it all the way along the Northwest Passage and he, he went, he relied on the natives up there, to, local people to take him across and in fact fell in love with a woman uh, with an Inuk who, who became his lover and his lifelong companion. And late after he, he made it, he went down to Manhattan. He took her to Manhattan with him and they were sitting in this incredible skyscraper and she was looking out the window and seeing carved things, you know, many, many, many feet in the air and she said, oh my goodness, I did not realize, but it has turned out that man has turned out to be more powerful than nature hmm. because he created this. And, you know, that's debatable, right? as we're discovering now, you know, with climate change. Indeed. But, but I think that debate, you know, how powerful is nature? How much can we overcome it? Can you make the world over in your own image through technology? Can you just go in and command a place? The North which is in many ways one of the most inhospitable places I've ever been in my life. I mean, it makes the Horn of Africa, you know, look like a, like a Caribbean resort. It rem that place reminds us of what you, of what you cannot do and what, and what you must think about if you attempt anything. I mean, even crossing the street to go to the store in the middle of a blizzard becomes a, a, a life-threatening uh, experience. Mm -hmm. So I, it seems to me that that modesty is an important thing to remember. And Canadian values, up until at least very recently, have always incorporated that. We've mm -hmm. always known the big frightening places up there. Alethea, you are, of course, of the North and have spent tons of time in the North, but you've also spent some time in the South. So I'd be interested in your perspective on this. Go ahead. Well, um, first, just a, 
a gentle, friendly reminder to Ian there that Knud Rasmussen was not the first person to, to go across the north on a dog sled. Inuit were doing it for uh, some time before him. He was the first European to do so. And that's the, that's the kind of language that we have to constantly remind southerners of that, you know, the north was not discovered by Europeans, that we've been here for a very long time. It's hard for me to understand um, why the North is romanticized so much. Just being from here, of course, I love my home and uh, I live here and it's it's my life. Um, it's only when I went to the South for school that I started being confront confronted with the stereotypes and uh, the romanticism that you see in the South over the North. And I was quite surprised to see it when I when I got down there. Alethea, you're going to forgive this follow-up question, but, but it, um, I was going to say it's as plain as the nose on your face, but it's actually as plain as the tattoo on your forehead. We, we, uh, I think people will be curious as to the beautiful art that is on your body. Can you tell us about it? Sure. They're traditional uh, Inuit women's tattoos, and uh, at one time they were ubiquitous all across uh, the circumpolar north from Alaska through Greenland and northern Canada and uh, Russia as well, where they're Inuit. Um, and they were a rite of passage into womanhood. And I made a documentary film about the, their history so I could go on and on um, about their meaning and that kind of thing. But essentially they were a rite of passage into womanhood and they uh, very nearly disappeared. And there, about, there was about a two year period where there weren't any Inuit left in the world with the tattoos and now uh, they're regaining popularity. I appreciate you indulging me with that curiosity. Okay, uh, Kevin, to you now. Uh, I think Cheryl pointed out it was three prime ministers uh, who have made the North a fundamental part of uh, their leadership qualities, and uh, clearly the guy who has the office right now goes to the North every year and has tried to make appreciation of the North a big deal in his government. The claim is that the North is a fundamental part of Canada and being Canadian. And I guess my question for you is, is it really? I think uh, we certainly want it to be. I mean, I, I would say, um, you know, I think that Southern Canadians have a yearning for the North, have, a, have a, a desire and a need to identify with the North. I mean, among other things, it's, you know, it's the one thing that really says we're not Americans. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, you know, that's a, 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 an important part of our identity as a result but, of that. But they've got Alaska, so they've got yeah, a claim to do, the north as well. it doesn't really count, and nobody really thinks about And even Alaskans, that, you know, they refer to the lower 48, and they don't even feel a part of, of America. But, but you know, I, so I think those of us who live in southern Canada um, uh, aspire to the values that we ascribe to the north, the hardiness, the humility, the, um, the, the kind of purity of it, um, um, you know, but, but I think beyond that, I think there's something more profound. I think there's a lot of people in this country, uh, a lot of Southern Canadians, who also aspire to have a real partnership with uh, the Indigenous people in this country, um, with the Inuit, with, with all of the Indigenous communities that are spread across, North, you know, all that space in the map that looks to us empty, you know, that's somebody's home, all mm. that land. And uh, so I, I think um, we want it to be a part of our, our identity. I know you had John Ralston Saul on here. He's written a lot about how, you know, this country was founded on three legs and it can only be strong on three legs. So, yeah, I think it's, I think it's important uh, in what it is and I think it's important for what it could be. Alethea, let me follow up with you because you're a northerner, you're an Inuk, you're female. Is all of that part of your Canadian identity? Do you see it that way? Yeah, well, um, and of course, being an, a native Canadian, of course, I'm constantly aware of the, the three legs of our um, nation. And I, I very much agree and respect um, John, with John Ralston Saul's um, words. And, um, you know, he's visited up here, and I really enjoyed hearing him speak, it was refreshing to hear people talk about the importance of uh, Aboriginal Canadians in um, the history of our, our country, uh, because that's largely been written out um, of the, the country's history, and it's nice to see that being respected and brought back, absolutely. Cheryl, take us back to your first experience with uh, the True North Strong and Free, and tell us how that helped you 
connect to your sense of being a Canadian? You know, it would have to go back to my childhood, which uh, is very hard to recall in any detail, but the sense of leaving a city in the summertime, the sort of patterns that one of our greatest historians, W.L. Morton, identified. We leave the cities, we go north, mm -hmm. which could be Algonquin Park, and let's face it, we know that isn't very far north. <laughs> Uh, and you went for uh, restorative reasons. You went for a reconnection with yourself, with your family, with the call of the loon. Uh, romanticized, yes, but real, because those lakes were there, the lakes are there, the loons are still there. Um, and then you had to return to the city having uh, received a kind of spiritual fix, if you will, to carry on with urban life. That pattern is still there. It has changed to a certain degree. And what I've noticed over my own lifetime, which I find extremely interesting, is the changing ideas of, your, of North. It's over the last, say, 150 or even 200 years, it's changed from being something just north of the small cities along the southern border uh, into a, an increasing understanding that the actual far north in the Arctic is not empty, is not barren, is, uh, is a home for indigenous people, for the Inuit, the Inuvialuit. And um, I don't know that we've progressed as far as we need to on that, but there's been a huge change here in the uh, awareness and the understanding that the old ideas which persist of purity and, and uh, challenge and maybe being humble in the face of such a harsh environment, um, that these are southern ideas and there actually is a northern home there for northern peoples and respect for those peoples. I think that if you had to look at one date to mark that, it would have to be the official uh, establishment of Nunavut. Uh, which comes in 1999 under Brian Mulroney. Um, there had to be a process to make that possible of consciousness, of awareness. But that would be where I say, if you're looking for a moment, that's the moment when surely, surely, the high Arctic and the far north enter the larger Canadian identity. Hmm. As a... Um as a Hamiltonian, I feel obliged to say it was the former Minister of Indian Affairs from Hamilton, John Monroe, who got that whole process started when he was in cabinet back in the days of Pierre Trudeau, but that's just me being parochial. Ian, <laughs> l l let me go on to you. Again, uh, there are some people who think that Steeles Avenue constitutes uh, the north of this country. We know that's not the case. Mm. Your first experience with the north and how it made you feel part of a sort of a bigger Canadian identity. Do you remember when it happened? Uh, when I went up there uh, for um, six weeks, five weeks to write about it for the for the Globe. When was uh, that? Uh, a year ago, uh, a year ago now. And you know, you get up there and you quickly realize that um, somebody had lent me a parka, and it turned out to be the parka that they wear in um, the Baffin Island Correctional Institute system. So I was for a while. I walked around as somebody wearing convicts' clothes, and nobody would talk to me. But I thought, well, you know, that, that they're unfriendly people. And you, you, you realize, once you realize that you're wearing a convict jacket, um, after that, that they, they are wary people. And, and then they are very friendly people, once you're accepted in. Um, people who trust you, a white journalist, the last person in the world who should be trusted is a white journalist, you know. Mm -hmm. But you go up there, and the, the, collect, the collective nature of life up there, uh, where you help each other out. I mean, people are close up there. They, they, they hang out more. They know each other. They, they you know, are related. They uh, share each other's children sometimes. They, you know, they, they drive you places and they'll do, you know, go for two days and help you do things. I mean, it's a completely um, other related society. And that was a shock uh, to me coming from, you know, the rapacious uh, south, as I as I do, and I also, I guess the the other thing that shocked me was how different the time frame is. You know, I'm I would run into I don't know I don't know if it was uh, 
you know, some of the founders of none of it who walk around the streets there. You know, it's like having John A. MacDonald or, you know, uh, uh, McGee walking around. But the, the, the people who actually founded the play, that, that formal political entity are, are right there. And they will say things like, um, well, you know, we're 40 years away from having an economy that's anywhere near Northwest Territories economy. And the Northwest Territories economy is, you know, in some ways a fragile thing. The, the time frame is almost geological. And here, you know, I, if I want something, I get on my phone, I go boom. Well, your phone doesn't work up there. You've got to mm -hmm. have, a, at least when I was there, you had to have a CDMA, a BlackBerry that went out of style in 2006. It was the only phone that would work up there. <laughs> Talk, you know, so, so things take a long time. And I think up there, where things have always taken a long time, people know that. Down here, we, we think, well, it's not taking a long time. They're not making, quote, progress. What the hell are they doing up there? Yeah. We're paying them $40,000 a head. You know, to, 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 that's the subsidy compared to 1000 bucks in Ontario. What are they doing? That, it's, not a, it's not the same culture. It's, a, it's a, a parallel culture that's been there longer than we have. Mm -hmm. And that takes a while to get used to. Kevin, you remember your original connection? Yeah, the first time I went to the Arctic was in 1987. My original connection actually came before that because I, at the time, I was a newspaper journalist. I was writing about nuclear weapons. From where? Uh, I was in St. Catharines. And I was invited to participate in a CBC radio show that was about the uh, remilitarization of the Arctic at the time in 1985 because the, you know, what I remember Brian Mulroney for first was that he uh, enabled the uh, rebuilding of the Dew Line, uh, and turning it into the North Warning Station in order to defend against nuclear cruise missiles coming across from Russia. This is the distance um, early warning line yeah, that goes the, back many, many years. It does. Yeah. In the 1950s, the Americans built the dew line across the Arctic, and, uh, including across, of course, our Arctic. And in 1985, they rebuilt it at the, as the North Warning System to guard not against bombers now, but against cruise missiles. So that was my first engagement with the Arctic, was learning about it as a strategic territory. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years later, I went, like Ian, as a journalist. And, uh, and I've been going ever since as a journalist, learning. Um, well, now that you've done the Polar Sea, it seems to me that me maybe the majority of the people that you bumped into when you were up there seemed to be French or Swedish or Norwegian or Russian, but not so many Canadians. Are other nationalities, do you think, more connected to and more interested in the North than we are? Well, there, I would say, um, I mean, nobody's as interested in the North as the Inuit. So, you know, you always have to say that to begin with. But beyond that, as outsiders, I would say right now, uh, the Polar Sea wouldn't exist were it not for the financing that was put into it from German television. Hmm. Um, uh, so they had an enormous interest in the Arctic. Now, I'm <laughs> glad it wouldn't exist if TVO hadn't also supported it. but. Um, it is hard to raise an interest, I would say, in southern Canada about the Arctic in any other way but a sentimental one. You know, it's, if you are getting on a plane in Heathrow, you might see a poster advertising Canada and it's got a big Inukshuk on it. And you're on your, in those ads, I was looking the other day at Canadian tourism ads that run abroad and they've always got someone with fur lined, you know. Now, that person's not necessarily going to be an Inuit, but somebody's going to be wearing a fur-lined hood on a parka. So we exploit the North. We always have exploited the North for our own, as uh, Ian says, sentimental purposes. Um, and as Cheryl said, but, um, but we don't actually, I would say, seek to understand it on its own terms in a very thorough way. I need to follow up with Alethea on that. I, I wonder how much that ticks you off, what uh, Kevin just said. Yeah, well, from my perspective, um, when people want to talk to me about the North, uh, you, when I travel in the South, it seems to either be that sentimental, romanticized vision of the North, or, uh, you know, it's, so tell me how horrible it is up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so either way, it's kind of, it's either romanticized or sensationalized. Um, it's really hard to have a real discussion about the kinds of things that we can do to improve the lives of people who live up here and improve the relationship between uh, the north and the south. So 
Um, but it, I, I do sense it changing, uh, even in my uh, short lifetime. Um, it, it's even even from 10 years ago, there are more people willing to listen, more journalists coming and realizing that they have an outside perspective and that we should be hearing the, voice, the voices of Northerners. And you see that just in the, in the film industry, which I work in up here. Uh, there's an interest from broadcasters in the South to hear from Northerners in, in a Northern voice. So that's, uh, it's progress. Cheryl, unless I'm miscounting, I've got Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Russia, America. Eight countries that have a direct connection with the Arctic. I wonder whether you think those other countries have a, um, a more sustained relationship with their North than we do with ours. What's your view? I would say yes is the, the quick answer to that, but I'd like to elaborate, and I'd like to elaborate by going back to a couple of earlier points, and uh, the key one, it seems for me, and I'm speaking now as a humanities professor in a university in a microclimate right down south, though I come from central Canada, but it seems to me that the critical communication uh, between southern and northern peoples in this country is carried through the arts. Uh, I believe that profoundly, through music, through television programs, uh, like the one you're doing, which I think is fabulous, bravo to you, uh, through uh, novels, uh, plays, f uh, you know, just films, inde inde independent, look what, look what um, Zacharias Kunick did with that in Arjawat. I mean, he, what attention he managed to get, not just at Cannes, but for the rest of, of Canada. Uh, or John Walker's uh, recent film, Passage, which more people should, should see. Nonetheless, these, these um, creations by people either from the north, Inuit, northern Dene, what have you, southerners, the artistic creations, the ways of communication uh, through uh, all our media, that's what's going to help to connect southern Canadians, new immigrants, just learning about the country, uh, with this you know, northern third of, of Canada. It's easier for people in Greenland or Norway uh, or, or Iceland or even in Alaska, it's easier for them to be connected to the North because their countries are so much smaller. And I would have to say, I think, because I've spent some time in, in these countries as well as in our Arctic, that the appreciation for uh, artistic uh, communications of varying forms in different media is higher in yeah. Europe than it is in Canada. So there's a lot of work to be done. But I credit uh, our artists and all disciplines in media, uh, and, and you know this series you're doing is a prime example of that, for raising awareness amongst Southern Canadians of all the country in which they live, which includes this one third that is very Northern. To that impressive list of artistic endeavors that you just put out there, we might add Alethea's Arctic Defenders as well. Absolutely. Uh, in, <laughs> in, so indeed, let's do that. Uh, Ian, if, if it's the case, as Cheryl says, that um, these other countries that have this Arctic connection are doing a better job at sustaining it than we are, what do you think that says about us, that we seem to think of ourselves as a northern country and with this great connection to the Arctic, but in fact, we're kind of not walking the walk, we're just sort of talking the talk. Well, the, uh, I think uh, Cheryl's point is a very good one. It, this is a huge country, and, and uh, we think of Southern Canada is a huge country, and then there's this other huge place right on top of that, and that's mm. still part of the country. Uh, I think if it were easier to get there, more people would go, and they would experience it. Yeah. yeah, it's it's extraordinary. I mean, I think we were there. My the Pete Power and I, the photographer who, who came up with me. Where'd you go specifically? We went right across. We started in uh, Callowit. We went up to Mary River. We went down again to um, uh, Dorset. We went across to Aglulik. We went up to Resolute. We tried to get up to Grease Fjord. We went all the way across. Any idea how much uh, the Globe spent to send you there? I think we spent a hundred grand on flights alone. Oof. Yeah, I, wow. at least a hundred grand on flights alone. Hmm. Uh, and that's why there's so little big-time journalism that's done, as you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so hard to get there. So it, it's very hard Together, I think 400 people last year went to all the parks 
up north. There's a ton of absolutely incredible parks up there. 400 people went. I mean, the 400 people, I don't know, you know, it's, it's non-existent. Mm. So if you, don't, if you don't see it and you don't see what it's like to walk for a day and not have the view change for a day because everything is so vast and so grand, then you, then you don't feel it. And, mm. I, you know, I, I mean, you can spend a lot of money on a giant mega project. Well, as Jim Balsillie did. As Jim, yeah, as lots of, you know. Frank, uh, the, Franklin Expedition. Yeah, uh, well, okay. and as, you know, uh, Baffin Land has up in Mary mm -hmm. River, as there's the new Tuck Road, you know, for 300 million. Uh, let's hope that works. But if there were a travel subsidy to go up there, I, uh, not that that's possible, but it doesn't seem like that grand a project, more people would get up mm -hmm. there. So uh, Alethea, what was your view of, uh, of the attempts uh, to dive into the Franklin Expedition history and then the success that the most recent effort had and, and the apparent, um, I mean, it captivated uh, so much of the country, even though 99.9% .9 of Canadians are never going to go anywhere near that. What would you think of all that? <laughs> yeah, I found it really amusing, to be honest. Um, <laughs> it, it just boggles my mind. I, I cannot understand why people are so interested in finding a man who was stubborn um, and refused to follow the advice of the indigenous people that lived there and therefore died. Um, I mean, he's just, in my opinion, another idiot that um, wouldn't follow the advice of people who know what they're doing. Uh, and I mean, there, there's hundreds of years of history of um, current leaders or uh, modern leaders refusing to listen to the indigenous knowledge of where that ship was. Finally, someone paid attention to what Inuit were saying about where the ship was. They found it, and still, our current prime minister in his announcements of um, about uh, finding the ship went on and on about the techno uh, modern technology that, that allowed them to find it and didn't mention a word about the Inuit uh, oral history that led them there. So, that, I mean, that, that whole... Um, that whole thing just uh, amused me in, in not a good way. Do, do you, Kevin, doubt Stephen Harper's bona fides on the trips he makes to the North, the connection he seems to genuinely feel about the North? What's your view on that? Really, you're going to ask me what I, my, my view on the Prime Minister? I think I just did. Uh, <laughs> well, in tonight's show, we, uh, Stephen Harper makes a cameo appearance. Um, in a community called Joe Haven, which is um, almost right in the middle of the Northwest Passage. And uh, so, and the, it'll, uh, he comes to Joe Haven. The uh, community puts on a performance, uh, shows their traditional arts for him. And he leaves Joe Haven and he ne never says a word to the community and as near as I can tell, he didn't actually listen to anything the community had to say. Um, and this is a community, like all communities in the North, that do have uh, substantial issues that, uh, you know, they want to communicate to the federal level because, of course, Nunavut's an independent territory, but most of its money still comes from, through transfer payments. So, so um, Their MP uh, is in the cabinet, though. Well, Ms. Gluecock makes a cameo appearance in the show as well. <laughs> and, um, it's a program of cameos. Yeah, and I mean... It, I, I, um, I, 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 I don't know what to say. I would have to go back to what Alethea said about, uh, you know, the Franklin thing, which is, was dealt with in, in our show in Friday night's uh, episode. And we contrasted the uh, Franklin, uh, not so much as a story of Canadian sovereignty, but as a story of an imperial expedition into the Arctic with the experience of the high Arctic relocation uh, uh, where, wherein people were brought from northern Quebec and from Pond Inlet and relocated up to Resolute and to Grease Fjord to stand in for Canadian sovereignty, to be a civilian presence on the Northwest mm -hmm. Passage. So, um, I, you know, the Prime Minister goes to the North every year and talks about sovereignty. Talking about Arctic sovereignty, and this is something Cheryl's probably got more interesting opinions on than me, but. It's something that Canadian politicians do to play for southern votes. Um, and it's also some kind of code, usually for something they want to do there, like build a mine or drill for oil or whatever. Um, and you know, the fact of the matter is that 
as Jeffrey Simpson has pointed out in your newspaper numerous times, the Prime Minister has gone to the Arctic every year of his reign, he has. and he's never said a peep about climate change. Now, in a, in a place where half the economy is dependent, at least half the economy, and the welfare of the people substantially is dependent on a subsistence economy that is just being torn to shreds by climate change in the North, to not address that is to really show that you at the very least don't understand the place. I can't speak to what his motivations or intentions are, but he doesn't understand the place. Ian? I don't want to jump in, but I, he, oh, he doesn't think of it as a homeland of, of, of a people. I mean, if he did, he would have done a lot more about, say, um, you, you know, and Alethea will talk about this, I guess, but, uh, housing in a Iqaluit. You know, there's 8,000 people, 10 or 12,000 jobs, and 5,000 houses. You know, I mean, that's a simple thing to take care of, but no, you know, if, you, if you're always looking at the big picture, you wonder really what you're looking at at all. Here, uh, if I could jump in here, Steve. And, Please. Uh, uh, yes, I'd like to have uh, the Prime Minister read a book that has been with us for a while. Called, it's by David Woodman, and it's called Unraveling the Franklin Expedition. And what David Woodman did in that book was to explore, years ago, Inuit testimony. So the Inuit knew where people should go, and they had their own understanding of the Franklin expedition. And indeed, Franklin and his men were, were stubborn and obtuse in the way they traveled. The other book I think that I would recommend uh, Stephen Harper read is Ken McGugan's Fatal Passage, on which John, the book on which John Walker based the film Passage, uh, because the one person who does get there, John Ray in the 19th century, actually dresses and behaves as much as possible as his Inuit guides tell him to. So there's a lesson in there. Uh, yes, it's about hubris. It's about patience. That's the thing that I found when I've been up north in the Arctic, that you need patience. We're not patient down here. You need patience, and you need to get rid of your hubris that you know best. That's a big lesson of, of the Franklin expedition. Alethea, before I get you to comment, let me read something since we referenced John Ralston Saul earlier on the program. Here's something he wrote in um, a few years ago in the Literary Review of Canada. He says, this is an ideal moment to listen to what Northerners are saying. They are continuing to suggest a myriad of approaches, practical and philosophical. These are philosophies of harmony and balance. They are indeed seamless and appropriate evocations of our physical reality. They remove the separation of the human from the place. The southern idea is that progress is an uncontroversial reality that solves problems. Anyone sitting on the outside of Western philosophy simply responds, what do you mean by progress? No one in the north is saying that southern science or its concepts of progress should simply go away. What northerners are perhaps saying is, that the philosophical concepts that shape most Southern ideas are undermining the advantages and promoting destructive side effects. Alethea, I'd be most interested in your view of what the former, I should say the current husband of the former Governor General had to say. Yeah, I, there are so many things that he says that I, I just think everybody should read uh, his new book, and forgive me, I forget the title at, at this moment. Um, but I have to bring it back to Prime Minister Harper for a moment. For a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's being very polite about um, his attitude toward the North, and I feel the need to just be a little more strongly word worded about it. You know, the idea of sovereignty in the North um, and the romanticizing of the North um, by the Southern population has been used by politicians for a long time um, to to further their uh, projects, mainly which involve uh, destructive resource extraction industries. Um, and the current Prime Minister, um, Harper, is no exception. He goes on and on about sovereignty in the North. And you know, I, think, I think the problem for me is that our definition of sovereignty is just different. And, um, you know, um, Cheryl mentioned John Walker's passage, and I, um, I wanted to point out, um, I did co-produce Arctic Defenders, but that is also directed by John Walker, and I really strongly encourage people to see that film as well, because it's all about sovereignty and how Inuit sees sovereignty versus how the South sees sovereignty. 
you know, Stephen Harper, I think, sees sovereignty as ownership of lands, which allows for resource extraction. And um, in the opinion of uh, most Inuit, I think it means not just ownership, but stewardship of those lands, hmm. and not just the lands, but of the people uh, living in those lands. And that means not just resources, but culture. Um, and Northerners um, have been, my gosh, the, the, the cost the peoples in the North have paid for uh, the Canadian government to be able to come up here and extract our resources. The cost to these people is extraordinary. Um, you know, the, the forced relocations, the um, slaughter of tens of thousands of sled dogs, uh, various uh, really misguided uh, government initiatives in order to be able to claim those lands and the resources in them. The least that we can do is make sure that these people have homes are fed, have jobs, uh, and you know, we just haven't invested in the infrastructure in the north that other uh, northern nations have. Um, Canada hasn't invested in the infrastructure in the north the way they have for all of the other provinces. Uh, someone, I, I, forgive me, I can't remember who now, explained to me that uh, Canada um, did a huge push uh, in investment in infra infrastructure across the country in the 50s and the north just kind of missed out on that because uh, our communities weren't uh, we, we weren't forced into communities yet so we kind of missed that boat um, so the same investment in infrastructure just hasn't been put in up there the way it has in, the, in southern Canada we have no deep sea ports um, we have very few roads we have no roads going between the communities in Nunavut um, and right through to today with our internet access. I mean, you just can't uh, survive and have an economy, any kind of economy in today's world without decent internet access. So we're just behind in every way. Cheryl Grace, uh, with just a couple of minutes to go, let me put this uh, final item on the table here. Uh, there was a time in this country when much of the rest of Canada, if I can put it that way, really wanted to find out about Quebec. We wanted to understand Quebec's aspirations. We wanted to uh, be more connected to Quebec. And you ended up seeing people in northern Alberta sending their kids to French immersion school as a result. I wonder if there's a similar kind of I don't know what that the rest of Canada can embark on as a kind of a national project today that would put us more in touch with the North, its people, connect us better. Any thoughts on that? Well, I, I would come at it uh, this way. It seems to me over history that when the North has really become the North, I mean, there are many Norths here. I mean, this isn't one homogeneous thing. That the North, the Arctic, is on the front burner of public attention and political and policy attention at times of crisis in our history. And this takes us right back into the 19th century. Uh, certainly that was what Diefenbaker was on about in the 58 election. It's what uh, Mulroney was facing with the pushback over free trade, etc. It's what we're facing now. And the crisis we're facing now has to do with climate change and the freeing up of the Northwest Passage uh, and the fact that Canada needs to have claimed sovereignty of that area in order to control resources. So. If there's something about which, if there's something around which we can rally as a population, uh, it has to do with climate change now and the responsibility we have for what is happening in the uh, high Arctic and the North, how that's having a uh, and going to have a continuing impact upon uh, Native peoples, Inuit and Northern Dene, um, because their life their lifestyle, their traditional way of life, their values uh, from which we have so much to learn uh, will be threatened. And I'll, the Inuit in particular are very adaptable and have changed in, immensely in a very short period of time. But what's happening now is, is, is beyond um, adaptation. We, mm -hmm. we need to address it. And it's the issue, I think, that can and should put concern about the North and identification with the North, which brings responsibility and understanding and appreciation that this is what will put it on the uh, front burner for Canadians. If if nothing else can, this, this should. Hmm. Alethea, with less than a minute to go, could I get you to address that? Is there one national project that we could embark on, like French Immersion back in the day, that would connect, connect us better to you? 
I think holding government accountable to the various agreements that they've signed with Indigenous peoples all across Canada would be the place to start. You, you can't uh, take on any single project without being sure that the government will stick to its word and it's just continuously sign agreements to this day, signing agreements and not holding up its end of the bargain. Uh, so if, if the government would just do what they say they'll do, that would be a start. That's a good place to leave this. Cheryl and Alethea, thank you so much for joining us from Points Beyond in Vancouver, British Columbia and Iqaluit, Nunavut. Great to have you on TVO tonight. Ian Brown and Kevin McMahon here in our studio in Toronto. And uh, again, Kevin, congratulations on a really triumphant series. Polar Sea, 10 parts. Second week continues tonight on TVO. Thanks, everybody. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.